The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. guys who used to be church planners who are now unemployed both bivocationally and from their church this is the yeah. church planner podcast and i'm pete mitchell hey and this is peyton jones and we have also been unemployed on this podcast well we've well, let me rephrase this you've ditched them i've been faithfully executing <laughs> podcasts both the thriving christian business podcast that i do with dave negri which happens to be more of a uh church-centered podcast than the Church Planner podcast, which I find, really? yeah, it's it's way more about God than business, like the last wow. nine episodes have almost all been, because of coronavirus, right? Like, how do you trust God in the middle of coronavirus and you're a business owner? Did I mean, you get Dave Negri saved as well? See, who who to thunk no, it? Pete he, Mitchell evangelist. Pete Mitchell he, evangelist. He's, a, he's more of a saved than I am. I'm barely like scratching <laughs> in more going, Lord, Lord, let me in. And Dave's he's like more saved. I, I you know, Pete Mitchell, Dave's I got think, his hand around. Need, Dave's got his arm around Jesus. He's like, hey, me and Jesus are right here. We're buds. I think Dan Sams needs to sort your theology out, man. That, that's all I'm saying. More well, saved dude, than let me. Let me tell you, the most fun podcast I've done is the one with Dan Sams. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I could. I can only imagine. If but you uh, do, do you tell him on that podcast, you go, oh, I'm totally more saved than Peyton. <laughs> um, I, I hate to say this but you've never even been a thought in our minds on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, Dan, if you guys aren't listening, hurt me. I don't know that I want to be in your sights on that podcast. If you guys haven't been listening to the from concealment podcast, you have no idea what you're missing. When a theologically sound pastor who enjoys firearms joins up with Pete Mitchell a not theologically sound anything who enjoys firearms. It's like good times for all right there. We actually are looking like prophets on that because when you go back and you hear everything that we say is coming with coronavirus and then it starts happening, people started calling like Dan Sams, especially they're like, you're crazy. You're crazy. And now they're like, um, what's coming next, Dan? <laughs> Cause <laughs> you've been right about everything so far. And so he's, we tell he's the COVID whisper. Oh, dude, I'm telling you. So, Crazy. man, we haven't we haven't done this in how long? Like, I haven't even gone and looked at our date. Like, it's been a while since we've been here together. Well, the last time we got together was for a special episode because we kind of abandoned everyone and didn't tell them, well, Peyton's being a pansy right now and he needs some time off. <laughs> I went to my safe space. Yeah, he, he really, what he needed was some time off from Pete. He was like, look, Pete, you and I need a break, you know. I got enough problems in my life, <laughs> that Pete and, Mitchell guy. And so we did an episode. I was like, look, everything that's going down with coronavirus, we can't just abandon them for one, and we need to, like, you know, talk about this. And you agreed, thankfully. We did the episode. I was, like, up in arms. I'm like, dude, guys, what's coming down is wrong and bad. And you're like, wait, wait, wait. Hey, hey, um, sunshine, sunshine, happy days, puppy dogs. Nanny and then sunshine to the rescue. And then two days later, you were like, what? What? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> like, you're calling me on the phone. You're like, I can't believe it. And all I could think of was the scene from the original Die Hard when John McClane's all, welcome to the party, pal. <laughs> <laughs> like, you finally showed up. Gosh. Yeah, you know, here's the thing is, you know, on that podcast, it's funny because the same thing happened on the Ministry Ninja podcast where it was early days and I said some things and I was like, you know, and I told Barry, I go, we're not posting that. And he's like, come on. And I'm like, no, man, because what if like millions of people die? And I'm like, hey, look, you know, yada, because I said, hey, you know, it's a flu. It's this, it's that. And I said all the things that I would still stand by. But at that point, I, I started to get a little, hmm, 
you know, maybe I'm wrong because yeah. I mean, there's all this panic. But at the time I pointed out, I'm sensing a lot of panic. I, you know, so at first rodeo, I was a psych nurse and the behaviors I'm seeing are not rational and reasonable. Um, and it was early and I, I just thought, oh, I'll pull it. Cause the last thing you want is millions of people die. And you can, you can feel this peer pressure in the sure. media. Well, on our podcast, right. I mean, now I look back and I go, that was prophetic, but now with, with our podcast, my my idea on that one was, hey, you know, as a church, we should take a servant posture sure. if we're going to save lives, yada, yada. But a couple days later, it was when they mandated. They didn't ask. They demanded. And now I, I am an American. I'm a Christian and I'm happy to be a servant. But when you tell people you have to, you've taken away their right to be a servant. You're going to find knuckleheads and morons and idiots no matter what you mandate. I mean, that's the way it happens. But yeah, I mean, a couple of days later, I was ticked. I was like, dude, you can't just demand things like this. And this is un- like there are constitutional factors here that you can't just throw out. You have to do everything you can as a governor. And I mean, President, I mean that term broadly. Right. Um, when when you state. have when you have state power um, or or governmental power or you know you call it what you want the the ability to rule and govern you have to still abide by the constitution and that was the part for me is hey I don't mind like doing you know putting the mask on social I don't mind doing any of it just don't demand that I do it. I've been social distancing for 44 years, buddy. (laughs) You have. That's true. But it's been my free will choice. And when they took it away is when I was like literally calling up people saying, let's get together. (laughs) Yeah. Because I'm like, how dare you? How dare you do that? Like for me, I, I, I go over this. Dan Sams and I go over it immensely in the From Concealment podcast. And then Dave Negri and I are like mind as well. So we kind of touch on it on the uh, Thriving Christian Business Podcast. So I I don't want to rehash all of that here. If you want to hear the crazy Pete talk, go listen to one of those. But um, to me, what's kind of scary as I'm looking at what's happening to the church, uh, what's coming down here in America is right now, um, the state, specifically California, New York, and New Jersey, have asked Facebook, hey, we want you to take down any um, any posts and you know do what you have to do to the people, ban them, put them in Facebook jail, whatever, who are promoting uh, protests. And so now they're violating the First Amendment right. And people go, oh, well, Facebook's a private company. Not when the government is using it to silence you. They can't go to a company and say, you, you must silence this person. That is now a violation of the first. And here's the thing, guys, that scares me when it comes to the church. Freedom of speech is the backside of the same coin as freedom of religion. You can't have one without the other. And we've already seen what they've done to religion. You know, they've basically said, you don't have freedom of religion unless we say you have freedom of religion. And freedom of religion, in our case, means the freedom of assembly. Right. Right. And, um, and that's scary enough as it is right now, unfortunately, 60% of America, according to the latest poll still thinks, well, this is the, the right thing to do. But again, whether it's the right thing to do or not, they're not asking, they're demanding. Right. And now when they go, okay, but we're also going to take away your freedom of speech. So you can't protest, which again is protected by the first amendment in the United right. States. That's a huge problem because you can't have freedom of religion without freedom of speech. The two go hand in hand. You have to have both. And I'm like, this is this is so scary that our government, one, believes they have this power, and two, no one is checking them. No one right. is checking them. <clears throat> the end is here. The end is here. The 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 end of the republic has come. And we're we're witnesses to it. And then yesterday with you know, oil prices went all the way down to 26 cents a barrel. Um, I'm like, okay, so we're going to war because Russia's not gonna stand for that. Russia will probably go to war with Saudi Arabia. China's just going to sit back and watch. Once uh, and that'll, of course, drag us into it. And then next well, thing you know, 
China just comes back and mops everything up. I mean, war is always good for the economy in the end. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, we haven't I mean, left a war. There's we your answer left. right there for recovering the the economy. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm trying to figure out how can I take advantage of the moment and be a war profiteer. You know what? Can yeah, I come up yeah. with a device? I don't know if it's a yeah, a bomb but I know you, sort. man. I know you. You're gonna end up being like Schindler. You're gonna go into it like that, and then you're gonna end up rescuing all these people and dying broke. Schindler always died. Like in the end, the only reason why he made it was because he had free labor. Yeah, but you know what? Like, here's the thing, though. Like at the end, that's that's going to be your Rod Tidwell moment where we get you to cry. You'll be like at the end going, oh, I made my only. and then I'll be like, I made Pete cry. I can die. I can go to heaven. This is I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I see what you're doing. I'm not going to do it. Oh, Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire. So it's good to be back, man. So uh, here we are. What? How, how you been keeping yourself in this? Uh, hey, hey, guys, if you're listening, this is what this show is. It is nothing else other than two guys catching up after a long absence away. And it, it was my fault. Um, I'll, I'll tell I'll tell Ron what I've been doing. Um, yeah, let's. Let, can we please hear about this again? Yes, I you know I love talking about it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk, but I'm gonna save mine because you know I'm just no I want to hear it I want to hear it <laughs> I, I want to hear the thing that no one's gonna buy because no one's gonna be in business anymore. So no kidding, ahead. right? Well, and and I might I might have just overshot my my word count a little bit by about 150 thousand words. So uh, are you serious? Yeah, yeah, but they've they've graciously said you know we'll up your word count by fifty thousand, but uh, so you, you still gotta have go to chop a hundred thousand off. <laughs> my books are on average 25 to 30,000 words total. <laughs> Try 250,000. You'll know why I've been busy. This was like the tome of church planning and it, it still will not see the light of day, but so maybe, tell everyone, tell everyone about it. Who, well, who, who, who hired you? Zondervan. Woo. Thanks for asking Pete. Always makes me feel good. You know, it wouldn't feel as good. I actually shouldn't burn any bridges. I better not mention small publishers. I might need them one day after this. Well, you're going to have 100,000 <laughs> words that you can go throw to someone else in a book. No kidding, right? That's the big question is, what do I do with this? Well, hey, there's always courses, baby. That's what, that's what I'm talking. Because I can't cut a whole chapter out, right? But uh, listen, my blood, sweat, and tears went into this thing. Um, my wife still barely likes me. Um, but you know, it yeah, was, that was like, always the way it was. So no change. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of true. That's kind of true. Yeah. So, so basically, I mean, she was rad, like the last three weeks, especially in all this, it was hard because I'd be up at like the crack of dawn and I'd be going to bed sometimes at midnight, still working on it. And I would take little breaks. Like sometimes the last two weeks were, I stopped walking, I stopped running, I stopped, uh, and I, and I, and I literally, because it was crunch time, I was like, and this is bad. You should never do this. I was like, I'm eating whatever I want. Like I was completely off sugar for months. Like, and then I just went and just ate, ate, drank whatever I want. And uh, I can honestly tell you that sounds really disgusting to me. It, it was, it was, it wasn't fun. So like today I got up and I'm like, is it yeah, a detox today day? Just, today is a detox day. You should just and fast I, today. Just don't well, eat anything more the rest of the day. I'm back to intermittent fasting, you know, because okay. I was doing all that, you know, so I'm back to all that. So all my neighbors are doing CrossFit. Everybody's like, I, I feel like the kid on the little rascals that's like, he has to practice his violin while everyone else is playing football, looking out the window. So, yeah, that to me was one of the biggest hits is when they closed the gyms because I was in the middle of a, what they call a bulking phase, a muscle building phase. I was six weeks in on a, a minimum two to three month stretch. And it was like, can't go to the gym anymore. Yeah. yeah. So I had to go to a, a cut phase. So I'm on, uh, I'm on a cutting phase, which I'll be on for the nice. next two or three months. Even if they open the gyms, doesn't matter. I'm, I cool. switched. So I got to do the cut. But nice. That was the big, the big bummer for me because I've only been able to work out here at the house. And uh, it's not nearly as fun by any means. Yep. Yeah. No, oh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that, that's tough, man. Cause it, it's kind of like they took everything you like except for television. Yeah. They did give me Tiger King, which well, I don't mean you Well, Tiger King. Okay. So we got to talk about this. That you show watch it? was rad. 
Oh my gosh. Guys, I want you to know that's seven hours of show that Peyton watched that he could have been doing Church Planner podcast for you, but instead (laughs) chose to do Tiger King. Hey, hey, every once in a while, no, like no kidding. Like I was staying up late too, because I'd get off and I'd be like, you want to binge? There was one morning we stayed up till like 2 a.m. watching that stupid thing. Because you can't stop watching it. You just can't I'm look away. You, it is one of the greatest shows that has ever been on TV. Did you watch Agreed. episode eight, which is the new one that they came out with? Wait, what? Yeah, there's a there's an episode eight, Joe McHale, or whatever the guy's name was from The Soup. He does an interview, and he goes back and he interviews oh a lot of gosh. the characters. Yeah, what? they just released it. In the middle of the, he's like, we're all stuck at home in the middle of this pandemic, so I get to interview these guys. And it's masterfully made, masterfully made. And I know he was doing all this filming and things, but it was just crafted so well. And I remember seeing the ad for it. And I'm like, heck no, I ain't watching no Jerry Springer white trailer trash. I saw his mullet. and I was like, I'm not going to watch this. It just looked gross. And then, and and then I'm listening to this podcast and these guys are, are, are talking about it. I'm like, Oh, Oh, okay, maybe maybe that's all right. But you know, I, I there's one takeaway I have from the Tiger King, and it kind of explains everything that's been going wrong, including with this podcast, why I haven't shown up, why P can't go to the gym, while everything has gone down the crapper, why American uh, government is misstepping and we're losing, as Pete says, it's becoming, we're losing our freedoms and it's becoming the end of the republic. And that's Carol Stinking Baskins, dude. You oh know, I know it. It all comes down to Carol Baskin. So from now on, on this podcast, whenever we're really angry about something, we're going to unleash on Carol Baskins. Jesus loves you. Oh my gosh, dude. Was that just not the best? The best I thought were the memes on Facebook that came afterwards <laughs> where people were like, for their delivery guy, uh, they put a note on the door. Mm. Did Carol Baskin kill her husband? Yes or no? And you'd leave the package by the yes or the no. That oh to me was classic. Oh my gosh. That was hilarious. Yeah. 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 So, that, I mean, that whole show, man, it, I thought what was really interesting in episode eight, which I just watched last night, I finally got around to it. Um, so Joe, Joel McHale, he goes back and he interviews all the characters, the guy who did the whole thing with a shirt off, and they go, why'd you do the whole thing with your shirt off? He's like, well, I got all these tattoos. I want to show them off. <laughs> <You know>? so, <laughs> Honesty is a great thing. Man. So he wanted to do it. With his, and then, uh, but every single one of them was like, Joe deserves to be in jail. Every single one of them. Oh, yeah. It was and so obvious. One of the, uh, the zookeepers, he was like, look, no, no, no. It wasn't the zookeeper. It was the, uh, the TV producer. He goes, look, the thing that they didn't show that I wish they would have showed is that Joe was deathly afraid of big cats. And you're like, what? And he's like, oh, yeah. He was afraid of all the big cats, the lions, the tigers. He was deathly afraid of them. He goes, the one scene that you see where he's in the cage with the white tiger and the other tiger, he goes, the white tiger's blind, and the other one was tranquilized. That was the only reason he was in there with them. No way. And he goes, and I was like, wow, man, they didn't show that, that he was like, that would have been right. Cause you could see that Carol Baskins was not good with her animals. Whereas Tiger King was, and brother, I, I gotta tell you, except when like, he killed him, when he shot him, I gotta tell you that Joe exotic, man, my, my heart went out for him. Did he not remind you of so many people in long beach? that came to faith. I mean, the whole time I'm watching, I'm going that dude would be Long Beach, Refuge Long Beach. I pretty much thought every character would have been Refuge yeah, Long that's Beach. that's true. Because, like, the guys who were straight, who were with Joe because of the meth, I was like, dude, this is this is Long Beach. You know, I'll do yeah. anything for meth. Yeah, I right. mean, that's that, that was Long Beach. Yeah, yeah. That, that put a damper on things when the mothership heard that we were doing Come to Jesus and We'll Give You Free Meth. That was not a, you know, it was not a good day, you know, tried to keep uh, it. By the me. way, guys, that is a joke. That's our <laughs> sense of humor. I'm just going to go ahead and get that out. I don't normally right make those jokes. You That's can usually tell. me. That's usually me. But, you know, you've, you've been deprived. Right. You, you haven't had your fix of Pete in the last month, month and a half. <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, we've been keeping 
you know, basically contact through almost daily memes, sending back sending each other just memes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That has become our new love language. Tell them about our survey. Survey what says, says what survey? Oh, we had our nine. You've forgotten already. Yeah, I did. I know. Oh, geez. Our I put that on Facebook. <laughs> I put that on Facebook. <laughs> did you see the image on Facebook? <laughs> Love has its limits. Love has limits. <laughs> so apparently it was our friend anniversary, and uh No, it's a friend anniversary. Friend There's no I in friend anniversary. Well, Pete. apparently not. And then uh I, I've never seen this before, but like Peyton sends me your friend anniversary challenge. And so the Facebook like asks you these questions that you have in contact with the other person. Peyton got a 60%. I got a 40%. And so he texts me, he goes, I love you more than you love me. This is proof. 20% more, but I only love you 60% total. <laughs> Just absolutely the funniest thing I'd seen in forever. And of course, then I had to Facebook that. So, yeah. yeah. I didn't know if you were saying you were love had limits because you only love me 20%. Like, hey, either way you want to look at it, love has limits. I don't, I suppose- it doesn't really matter. It's kind of like an equal opportunity. I don't love you that much. So I guess it's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So. Man, I missed our podcast. You know, I, I got to be honest. You know, we've done this thing I for can, seven I can be years. honest too and say that I've actually found a, another outlet in my two other podcasts. So I, I could take or leave this one. It doesn't matter to me anymore. Dang. Dang. Ouch. You've, you've, wow. lost your, you've lost your chance with me, okay? I've moved on. Yeah, it's it's like having a teenager, you know, you, you got all testy and upset and you crashed the car a couple times and then it's like now you left that you don't come home. You don't come back, you know. I just all I want is to spend time with you now and just you know, it's all right. P, I have a pot roast here. You know, it, it's funny speaking of that, that's what <laughs> what is that from? <laughs> I was about to tell you. So my mother in law Whenever she wanted me to bring Andrea over, she wouldn't call Andrea and say, hey, come. She'd call me and she'd be like, oh, Peyton, I made some prime rib. And I'd be like, she's the smartest lady ever. And I'd turn to Andrea and go, hey, let's go to your mom's. That's that's how it would happen. Interesting. Interesting. Just, that, was a, that was a smart way to do it. You know, I will say this about this whole coronavirus thing. So um, my family and I, we're, we're not... Uh, law-abiding citizens at all, <laughs> at all. <laughs> we we actively seek ways to violate uh, the illegal restraining order that has been placed on us by the state. And my mother-in-law, this is the best thing. My mother-in-law is afraid of absolutely everything, everything in the world except coronavirus. <laughs> like wow. This thing, she literally is over at her house every day. She will go to the store every day because it gets her out of her house. So even though she can only go to basically Target right now, she goes every day. Wow. Cuz she's like, "Look, I've lived through and she'll like name off everything she's lived through and she's like, I'm not worried about this." And so she comes over. Yeah, you know, and and that was kind of the thing for me, kind of coming from a a medical background, knowing the media to be what they are. You know, I realized that, okay, this thing was, you know, people, people died. Nobody wants to say like, oh, you know, like maybe this isn't, there's a peer pressure, you know, that you can't say, you can't even challenge. and, And for me in the beginning, I was like, well, you kind of got to wait and see a little bit. Now it's like, no, no, you don't wait and see people die. Well, I could say that about anything, right? And and to be honest, we just didn't have the facts. And, and, and I know how the funding works in hospitals. So like when they're saying right now, like, well, people are, are dying of things. Like I know somebody, um, they're, they're, one of their friends died. And they're like, yeah, you know, like they didn't die of coronavirus, but they put that on yeah. the cause of death because that's where the funding's at right yep. now. Yep. So, uh, you know, but but kind of knowing all this stuff, I'm like, yeah, you know, like I, we don't have the data. And that's what I kept looking at was, do we have the data? Because it was changing every other day. 
And so when, whenever I start seeing that, I'm like, okay, nobody knows. And, you know, Fauci, I think looking at him, like people love him or hate him. I have a balanced view on him. I think, um, into February, he was saying, no, no, you're good. Like February 29th, he was going, no, you don't need to, you can still go out. You can still, you know, he didn't seem to be the alarmist that people want to want to paint him as. I think he's done a reasonable um, job of kind of keeping abreast, but even he has said, we don't really have the facts. You know, they're, they've put him in this position of saying, you know, how can we best you know, uh, eliminate risk. And he's done the best job. I think that he can, um, given, given the data. And, uh, but I, 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 it's just one of these things where you really don't know what's happened till much later, right? People will find out all the data they need and we'll find out later whether this was all like, whew, you know, like, thank God, you know, people acted or we'll find out, um, down the road that, uh, you know, the, there was something else going on. And yeah, you know, the thing to me, though, that I also look at with all of this is, <clears throat> and, and this is the part that everybody who's like, you got to stay at home, which again, my point has been, look, I, I don't care if you stay at yeah. home. Yeah, it's fine. Like, I believe in freedom of choice. Go ahead and stay at home. That's great if that's what you choose to do. However, your rights end where mine begin. You don't get to tell me I have to stay at home. If I choose to stay at home, that could be a loving act for you because I don't want to infect other people, or it could be I'm trying to protect my family because maybe someone in my family is high risk. You know, they've got uh, an autoimmune condition or a lung condition. I'm like, look, we don't want to risk anything. But the reality is, is if, if I choose to quarantine myself and stay at home and not go out, well, then nothing you do out there is going to affect me, right? Right? Because I'm quarantined. Right. So this whole, no, you have to be imprisoned in order for me to be safe is total bogus. It's total bogus. It doesn't make any sense. But the thing that bothers me the most is everyone is totally ignoring the cost. And I don't mean the financial cost. I mean the cost in lives. We have seen suicides go through the roof. The, uh, the hotline that, normally, that handles suicides normally gets 1,000 calls a day. During this pandemic, they've been at 25,000 a day. We know yeah. statistically there's a direct correlation yep. between suicides and unemployment. And we're at a higher unemployment than we've been since the Great Depression, I think even before the Great Depression. It's like, it's going to get worse. And it's yeah. like, okay, so those lives are not worth anything to us so long as they didn't die by coronavirus. And I'm like, right. this is wrong. This is yeah. completely, total wrong. Not right. to mention... Everyone is judging it based on where they're at financially. Okay, I can survive right now. Well, what about your barber who doesn't have a job because he can't go to work? He's self-employed, so he doesn't get unemployment. He can't now feed his kids or pay his rent. What about that guy? You literally are just going to crap on him and don't give a rip about him because you're worried that... I don't know what you're worried about exactly, but somehow you've bought into the panic, but you know, screw that guy. I don't care about him. I'm like, this is wrong. This is completely wrong. This is not America. This is not freedom. This is not love either to force someone else to not be able to provide for their kids. That's not love at right. all. Right. No, I got to agree with you. And I, I think it, at the end of the day, um, you know, like I, I can't go into details, but something happened on my street, which was insane. And, you know, he, he, because of being Dr. locked up. Yeah. 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 And Dr. Drew and, you know, Dr. Phil and a lot of the, the kind of pop psychologists that are out there, they're saying exactly what you're saying. And they're, they're kind of saying, Hey, you know, like alcohol sales jumped up, you know, the, um, the addiction, drug addiction. Um, will, I know will police calls for domestic violence have shot through the roof. Right. We're going to see tons of separations, tons of divorces when you can finally do it. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, it's the, the toll on our society is going to be so much worse than what coronavirus has been. Yeah. Yeah. I got to agree with you. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, when, when they heard the alarmist, uh, like the worst prediction of the numbers were clearly alarmist, 
those were alarmist numbers. Well, you, you and, mean Gavin Newsom's, hey, I'm going to have 26 million people who have this in the next six weeks? You don't think that right, was? I mean, right. come on, dude. Like, that didn't even make any sense back when he said it. Right. Like, right. if that's going to happen, then literally social distancing is not going to do anything. Why are we even yeah. wasting our time? Yeah, 40, 40 million in the state, but 26 million are going to have it. Only in six weeks. Million. And that was about six weeks ago he said it. Right. So you know right. he's going to be sitting there championing, oh, see, social distancing worked. I made you all stay Well, and here's the thing is we're at the point now where, uh, you know, again, now they're saying, well, it'll it'll go through another cycle if we don't stay this way. And Oh, I believe they, they plan it on it. I think come um, winter, absolutely, they're going to go back and they're going to do the whole thing all over again. 100%. Yeah. yeah. I, I I guess, you know, and it's funny, man, because I, you know, being from a medical background, I, I, I appreciate vaccines. I like vaccines. I think vaccines are the way forward. Um, now all the anti-vaxxers are freaking out. But, you know, but when you start telling me we have to. Yeah. We have to. Like, again, it it's where I go, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, go like, hold on there, chief. You know, like, I'm for that. Just don't tell me I have to. See, when, when when you do that, it changes the dynamics. And I always kind of like to, yeah. to point out to people that, look, God could, could mandate everything. Like he tells us, like people say, oh, the Ten Commandments are not the Ten Suggestions. Well, they are kind of in a way, like God yeah. doesn't enforce them with you on that. He allows you to go, you can break all 10 of those every day of your life and not get punished by God until you die. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that life ain't going to punish you. Life's going to kick you pretty hard if sure. you go breaking all Ten Commandments. And it may be that God intervenes and, you know, ex exerts some direct intervention in your life and judges you or punishes you or condemns you or what have you. But the reality is that, no, actually, God, who is all-powerful, who could do anything he wants, doesn't enforce his law on us. He asks us, right. do this. And, and so I kind of, you know, it's the same thing. And, and, and it, it informs how I think of government is how God does it. Um, and people might go, oh, the Old Testament God. Yes, he did. He did in the Old Testament. And there was a reason for that. But that is not the way that we do things today. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's interesting too. Like some of the the cool things that I think have have come out of this, because um, our our last episode was on virtual church and dealing with that, right? Oh wow! Well, that was you and me. You remember I that? I didn't know we were so groovy. I didn't oh, know we, we were on it about. like that. Well, one of the things that, and and I think we're we're starting to see now some of the the huge dangers that are coming because. Watching your church online is really turning church into a spectator sport. Right. Because now I don't even need to show up. Like, <clears throat> I mean, it's what is church? It's not a chance for us to hear from each other. It's a chance for me to hear from the pastor. Like right. that's what church is when it's online. One of the things, so I did, I held a mastermind group. I do it every month. Um, and I decided to, to reach out to people who have been through the program uh, before. So we had, you know, I don't know, 10 or so different pastors on this particular call. And one of the guys, um, uh, Adam Richardson, out of, I believe he's in Utah, they were doing some really cool stuff. So they were, th they were doing, uh, instead of doing like the whole, hey, you know, pastor gets up there, preaches in the Facebook, and everyone watches – which a lot of people are doing. And hey, you got to do something. I get that. I, I'm not trying to knock that. I'm just saying, here's what he was doing that I thought was brilliant. And so I give this to you guys as a nugget, something for you to steal, because I've literally been stealing it and teaching it to my real estate agents who I train. Um, they're doing Zoom. Basically, think of it as like a Zoom Bible study, where instead of it's just a guy preaching, you're all showing up on the Zoom meeting, and there's interaction back and forth, kind of like how Refuge Long Beach did church, where there would be interaction back and forth. And so then they started doing, hey, you know, what if we just did, you know, uh, to give you an example, one of my um, partners does something called Coffee with Debbie. So every Saturday morning, she gets a whole bunch of business people online uh, in the real estate market, and they talk, and they have their cup of coffee. 
they started doing that exact same thing where it was just like, you know, hey, let's get together for coffee and inviting people in the neighborhood. And so he was going into uh, like Facebook has groups for different communities. Like there's one for Rossmore where I live and he would just go in there. Hey guys, I'm going to do a uh, Zoom coffee morning, you know, Friday at 10 a.m. Anybody wants to join me? Here's the link. And just getting to know people in his community that way. And I was like, that is freaking brilliant. That is like thinking outside of the box. It's not, hey, I'm going to do a Bible study. It's let's just have coffee. And um, now this is not necessarily the way a lot of our pastors would go, but this one guy is doing um, uh, like he does uh, uh, a mixology class. He brings in a guy like teaches how to mix alcoholic beverages. Um, he's not a pastor, but uh, uh, Caesar Kalinowski, he does a happy hour in front of his house and they literally have, uh, um, I told him he should have Corona out there cause I thought that would be like the perfect beer to have, but I think it's like mixed drinks and they have it out on a table and they have like hand sanitizer and you get to go make your own and they just like sit on their lawn and like talk to you. And I'm like, that is maintaining brilliant. social distance. Of course. Yeah, they were maintaining social distance That's and, rad. you know, making it fun for their community. And I'm like, dude, some of these ideas of what these guys are doing to reach their community are just fire to me. That, that is absolutely fire. Doing the Zoom thing and like, hey, I'm just going to do coffee. Coffee with people in my neighborhood. Because I would never know anyone in my neighborhood, literally, because I don't like meeting people. But that would be brilliant. You know, I'm just, I'm wondering when we get to like move around in hazmat suits, you know, like that, th this is the time. Like, you know, we could be like back to the future when he's got that hazmat on or, you know, you name it, Walter White. I mean, yep. th this was our time. You know, and, and we've wasted it. Hazmat suits should be like standard fare now. Like we're living in a post-apocalyptic universe. I know you keep saying helpful things for church planners and I'm kind of like, I've just been let out of my room. Hey, I'm not trying to say helpful things to church planners because believe me, my other two podcasts have been pretty much <laughs> condemning the state. And by the state, I mean, every government entity there is just coming down on them like a ton of bricks. I just, I thought these were like really great ideas what these guys are doing. And that's why I wanted to, to just share it as an idea, something for you guys to consider. It was awesome. Could you hear my cat, by the way? Is that what that was? Yeah, he's crying because he wants to go outside. The girls run outside and he's all upset. Do you know, you know I got a kitten? My other one got eaten did, by a did you use your Did you use your money from the government to buy yourself a tiger? They're only three grand. <laughs> I think I got any money from the government. Hey, Andrew has been checking our bank account. Well, where's my money? Dude, but, I won't uh, get any. I, I made too much in 2018, and that's the tax year they're using. I'm like, yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Like, oh, I'm not going to get a single cent from the government. And I need uh, money, too. I'm like, yeah, but it ain't 2018 anymore, baby. It's 2020. Money. Man, this cat, I'm telling you, his name's Edward. And because uh, we, we call them Edward Scissor Hands. He's got these really sharp claws, but cuts everybody and hangs on everything, rips everything. Now we know I can never come visit you. I'm allergic to cats. Are you really? Oh, you yeah. know, I've always had a cat. So I if know. you if you always wondered why why you started sniffling and sneezing, now you know. No. And, I've uh, I've always known. That's why I would stay outside. Yeah, it's a it's a weird time, man. I'm How's your dog my, doing? She's she not doing good, brother. No. She she's starting to she's starting to go down to hell and kind of no. lose her lose her, her 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 abilities to do things and keep certain things in. <laughs> she's That's struggling a bit. That's not yeah, good. but the tortoise is doing great. She outlived us. You found her. You found her. Yeah, yeah. She came out. She was like, hey, you know, she was sleeping under the kayak, kayak in the back of the garden, <laughs> which I kind of thought. That's the only place because we've talked about this. Like I get neurotic about my tortoise and I, I, where is she? I don't know where she is. And I, I start looking, you know, all over the place and, and I just didn't want to go. And the, the kayak was all nicely tucked up and uh, I didn't want to go. But anyways, we, we, we found her. She was under there. When do you kayak? I don't, I'm not a big fan. Xander's and she loves it. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when I, when, when I really, really want something, I make bargains. Hey, I'll go kayaking with you. If, uh, you know, we can, uh, do Lord of the Rings marathon, that kind of thing. Oh yeah. Okay. I'd be asking for something else, but that's great. Whatever, <laughs> whatever works for you. <laughs> 
Yes, I have to not say a word right now. <laughs> Welcome to the Church Winter Podcast. Yes, and that's hey, pretty so much. Hey, so Peyton, let me ask you, when you're doing all that kayaking, <laughs> how do you get all the stuff done for your church that you need to get done, like payroll and and those end-of-year tax statements, which now I don't know if they've been pushed off or not, because I certainly haven't touched taxes. They told me it wasn't due till July 15th. I'm not touching them, but how do you get help with all of that? Well, Pete... Between all the times kayaking and cashing my government check, I don't have a lot of time to actually run a church. So what I do, Pete, is I go to SimplifyChurch.com. SimplifyChurch.com. They simplify my church. And let me tell you how, Pete. What they actually do is they do all my bookkeeping. They'll help me send into your tax donor receipts. They'll even help me with a website, a virtual assistant, and even change the oil of my car. What? Oh, yeah, they do everything. Pete, simplifychurch.com. Go check them out and tell them Peyton and Pete sent you. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> hey, that's that's it. I mean, we kind of did that. So, uh, guys, this has been Peyton Jones and Pete Mitchell. I had to give you the same. Uh, reminding you that if you want to reach the ones nobody's reaching, you need to go where nobody's going and do what nobody's doing. You, you need to Zoom where nobody's Zooming and uh, have coffee was, where nobody's having coffee. You know, it rang hollow when I said it. I heard it. I was like, yeah, you can't go. You need to stay at home, dang it, and do what everybody else is doing and watch the Tiger King because you know it's all about Carol Baskins. Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Music